Welcome to Public Health America, a weekly program produced by BronxNet in partnership with Mercy College. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. Here on Public Health America, we speak with experts from an array of specialties across the liberal arts and health professions to provide you with not only the best science, but practical tips to live a healthier life. We also celebrate what studies have long documented, namely the unparalleled value of a liberal arts college education by setting the stage to pursue a career of your choice, increase lifetime earnings, and engage in civil debate. Our experts will share decisions they made and support they received that helped them to beat the odds. By sharing one or two life lessons, their stories may provide you with the inspiration and method to realize your dreams. This is Public Health America. Welcome to Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. It is my pleasure to have with us today Dr. Paris Atkins Jackson, or AJ. AJ, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So I know you've been doing some cutting edge work as assistant professor at Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health, Department of Epidemiology and Social Sciences on racism, particularly as it affects older adults. Tell us a little bit about your work. Sure. So my group, uh, the Marvin Gray Matter family, because I didn't want a lab, I wanted a family, right? An investment in doing science a different kind of way. So our group, made up of graduate students, postdocs, early career faculty, and senior faculty, we track structural racism over time from 24 years prior to when our modern day older adults would have been born. We track racism during their childhoods into their early adulthoods when they would have entered the job market and the experiences they would have. Then all the way on into the present day state in the age group that they are in now. So we look at everything from occupational segregation, re residential segregation, wage theft. Um, we look at the whole gamut of structural racism and its impact on this group obviously critically important uh, thing to study. Now you say structural racism. I can make a guess, but rather than doing that, if you could give us a definition, you've said, you know, occupational uh, issues, wage theft, you offered two or three examples. If you could define structural racism, the structural part, and uh, and maybe give some examples that might help our, our viewership understand the the, 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 you know, setting the table, so to speak. Sure. So structural racism, I like to use a composition of two definitions, one from Tamara Jones, which is, this is a system that unfairly disadvantages a group based on how they are racialized, for example, Black or Latinx. Um, <laughs> It also unfairly advantages a group based on how they are racialized, for example, looking white. Um, but combine that with Dr. Zinzi Bailey's definition of this really being a system that operates through every fabric of our society, every organization, every institution, the police, healthcare system, every part of our society is sort of filtered with these concepts of structural racism. And so therefore you'll have zoning law that disproportionately provide fewer healthy food options to neighborhoods that predominantly people racialized as Black or Latinx or Asian, um, but provide more healthy food resources to areas with predominantly people racialized as white. So that's the way structural racism really works through our society to disempower and disenfranchise groups. Thank you for that clear definition. So, I mean, clearly that canvas is exceedingly broad. Um, and I am definitely not an expert on the history. Um, it just seems like what a lot of the structural problems that, that I'd like to learn more about that you are primarily focused on it's, they've been around for decades and uh, in some ways, hundreds of years. 
they seem to a, the lay person, I think, slightly intractable. How, I, I'm just trying to think of the question. How, how do we- What can we do? What, how do we truly move the needle? Well, for me, it starts with telling this story about the impact of structural racism, because in my field in aging and Alzheimer's disease and dementia, we often come to this understanding of health disparities where, oh, it's someone's behavior, it's their culture, it's their genes, when really it's history. This is a symptom of history impacting our older population for over 90 years. This is the reason why we're seeing health disparities in this group. And if that sickens you enough, then we can begin to have the conversation about what things you can do differently. I often encourage my scientists, colleagues to do science differently, ask different research questions, examine the impact of history over time. I ask my colleagues and my community members in the world to think about the ways we're implicit uh, about our racism, even <laughs> in racism, right? Some of us vote for people who we know are very toxic to society, knowing that it might not impact us, but it will impact the health and well-being of another racialized group. So these are the ways where we can actually do something to change it. And is your work, um, work with Alzheimer's uh, and older adults with dementia, um, maybe you can talk a little bit about that aspect of your work. Um, is it fair to ask, you know, at a school of public health, what's the epidemiology of Alzheimer's and dementia by racial ethnic lines? And are there differences to access to care, access to assisted living, access to support of family members who are caring for um, an older adult with Alzheimer's or dementia? Uh, dementia? Uh, what are... Uh, what are we faced with today in terms of those issues as it relates to structural racism? You know, this is an interesting question and I will give it to you in two ways. So first, yes, 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 and yes, right? Uh, we keep seeing the disparate numbers between black and Latinx groups having 1.5 to two times the greater rate of cases of Alzheimer's disease, greater mortality, greater incidence at a, in an earlier part of their life course. Um, but I think that's really not what tells you the magnitude, right? Those are just figures. The reality is, is if someone has survived in our society to be a part of it for decades upon decades, contributing to our economy, contributing to our creativity and our arts and our education, do they deserve the experience of Alzheimer's disease because of the way we have built our society? And if the answer to that question is no, then that alone for me is the magnitude. Because we cannot treat our elders and our aging population as if it is their fault or something they are lacking in their community that is contributing to their poor health. Sure, and so agreed. Um, I, I'm, I'm just trying to think through how to frame the next question because I've I've yet to hear a socio-cultural explanation of a disease process like Alzheimer's or dementia, meaning that it's thought of, I think, more as a physical process, even though we might not really understand the mechanisms fully. Um, you mentioned that one and a half to two times, if I got it right, persons of color, uh, one and a half, two times greater rates of Alzheimer's and dementia. I actually didn't know that. Is that, am I getting that right? And if so, yes. what, what is the, is there a, a, an understanding of, of why that's, uh, what, what factors are contributing to that massive difference? Well, that's what I'm studying because unfortunately in the field, the goal to strategy is to blame individuals' behavior. There uh, was a very popular paper that came out of The Lancet that talks about if we address some of these particular areas like smoking and diet, um, would we reduce sort of the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease? And all of those sort of traditional ways of thinking about things, people's behavior, people's cultural practices, people's genetic makeup, made up for less than 
So I'm looking at the historical ramifications of things because I think that this is really what's driving whether or not you have access to healthy foods at a pivotal part in your neural development, whether or not you're under the stress and strain of police brutality throughout your life course. I mean, our right. modern day older adults live through historical lynchings. Right. Uh, what impact does that have on you cognitively, psychologically throughout your life course. Uh, that's why I'm looking at those things. And I think racism does get underneath the skin. And that's the purpose of this kind of research is really just to say, you know, we think of them as social cultural outside of um, what we think of as biologized impact right. the body. But really, these things have been getting underneath our skin. Think about the last stressor you had. Did that impact your appetite, your digestive system? Did that linger in your body for several days? Did you recall that event 20 years later and feel that same physiological stress? Well, imagine what's happening to our elders. No, that's, that's so aptly put. I mean, what that makes me think of, uh, AJ, is just sort of the impact of trauma. Mm -hmm broadly defined and, you know, wanting to think about, and you meant, you sort of alluded to this, you know, trauma at developmentally critical moments in time and how that might also influence things like, you know, uh, neural development in the brain, you know, not only cognitive development in terms of behaviors, but uh, actual neurological development uh, is, the, I don't want to take us too far afield, but is there a literature that dovetails with your work that looks at the impact of trauma and how disproportionately high levels of trauma among uh, subgroups, including persons of color, could lead to these kinds of outcomes? This is the new literature that in the, in the I would say in the last few months that I've been sort of diving into. Um, and it's not exactly uh, the work that I do, but I just like to be aware of it. Um, but I've been noticing some research on trauma and hippocampal atrophy that I think is really promising, giving sort of the hippocampus really um, pivotal part in our stress response. So I think that's some promising literature, although it's not the, the kind of research that I do. I sort of piggyback off of a lot of the work done on allostatic load, on uh, cognitive um, stress. Um, that's sort of the, the literature that I lean into to look at the impact of historic racism on uh, dementia incidents over time. Fair enough. And with, with about a minute left on this segment, what is... What is a key intervention or approach that, that your work informs, particularly when working with uh, older adults with Alzheimer's or dementia, to combat, if you will, structural racism? Two things. So first, I think there are interventions where we can relieve the stress and strain of these traumatic memories. Dr. Raina Croft does this work with walking groups and memory with older Black adults. I also think there's a policy level change where we can see that residential segregation is still continuing to occur, school segregation still continuing to occur. If we can see through the lies of our elders that this is problematic, that this is what increases your risk for certain health conditions, then it's imperative upon us to change those policies now, to intervene before we have a new generation of people who have these health experiences. That's great. Um, so we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, AJ, Dr. Adkins Jackson, will tell us a little bit about her experience as an undergraduate and how her education in college and beyond provided the opportunity to establish such an excellent career focusing on research to help persons with color struggling with Alzheimer's and dementia from structural racism. We'll be right back. This is Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer.
Welcome back to Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. So Dr. Atkins Jackson, AJ, I always open this segment with the same question. Tell us where were you born and some of your formative experiences? Sure. I am, this is the, the reason why my title says that I am a multidisciplinary community-based health equity researcher because I really situate myself in the community. I am from what back then was called South Central Los Angeles. Now it's been, been cleaned up to call South Los Angeles, but I am from what people would often consider a very stereotypical impoverished <laughs> neighborhood. I grew up poor. I grew up struggling in school because we didn't have sufficient resources. I grew up though also with working people who were my examples. Every day I rolled out of bed and watched those people get up and go to work with a smile on their faces and come back home. And that always inspired me. How do you, after what we just went through last night when the police were on our block, how do you get up and go to work again? And I'm from that kind of community, the people who no matter what we go through, we get up and we try to make the world better every day. So that's the kind of South Central Los Angeles I'm from. Um, and I'm from a school system that was overtaxed, had too many people in the classrooms, but I had these very special, amazing teachers like Ms. Baxter in the third grade, who was all about science and loved giving us science projects. And I just love that lady. I, I would get up every day excited to go to her class at 8 a.m. That's the kind of South Central LA that I'm from. That's great. You know, uh, it, having that kind of testimonial of, uh, you know, a, a, a passionate and gifted teacher, in this case, uh, Ms. Baxter, you know, those are, I mean, you know, all we need is a million more of those and maybe we can address some of these issues. Um, so tell us, you know, uh, it, it sounds like your family was very supportive and certainly, you know, uh, as you say, getting up, going to work, doing what had to be done. As you approached college age, uh, what kind of decisions were you making? What kinds of options were you considering and where did you ultimately land? You know, what's interesting about my story is that I'm a music baby. My father was a musician. So I went to music school, junior high and high school. So I was a part of that bust class that was bust out of my neighborhood. And I really struggled. And I've talked about this in several places. I struggled really hard to work through leaving my neighborhood with no trees and going into areas with trees uh, and resources. I couldn't manage it, so I didn't often do well in my classes. So there was never an expectation that I was going to college. But I had these like, you know, always these special people and places. I had my grandmother who had no idea how I should go to college, but she just knew that I should go to college. So all my life she talked about the day I would go to college. But I didn't know how to get there. Like the college counselor was busy with all the students who had better GPAs than I. I never reached out to me to talk about it. And my classmates, I mean, many of them, college were, was already in their trajectory. And I came from a community where it wasn't. So I didn't know how to work through it. But I had these beautiful people in the process that helped along the way. For example, a college recruiter at my undergraduate, Humboldt State, University, we call him R. Dove Hicks. He was always in South Central Los Angeles, in Oakland, recruiting Black students to come to that state college at the top of California in the trees. He recruited me, and that's how I ended up in college. That's great. Yeah, another testimonial that's so important to have, you know, people uh, representing undergraduate institutions getting out into neighborhoods where maybe, uh, you know, a majority of students are not necessarily, high school students aren't necessarily thinking of that trajectory. Uh, so that's, that's a great story. And then you went to Humboldt State. Tell us about your major. Tell us about your experience there. Sure. I majored in journalism. Uh, along the way, I got a minor in, um, in ethnic American studies. So what I'll tell you about Humboldt is I started very different uh, the day before and then the day of classes. The day before was a complete accident that I ended up at Humboldt. I was like, 
I'm not going to college. I don't know anyone who went to college. You're asking too much. It felt like such a tall task for me to get to college. And luckily my mother trapped me by saying we were going on a family vacation, packed up all of my stuff and drove me to the college and put me out on the front steps and told me not to embarrass her. And because of that, I made a decision. I was like, you know what? I have an option to try. I'm gonna try. I threw myself into college. I was a part of every multicultural center, every dance group, every music group. I mean, you name it, I was in the meetings trying to learn. I, I wrote for every magazine, every newspaper on that campus. Like I kept a busy schedule because that helped me be a part of the college community. It helped me push towards a graduation date so that I could finish. It also gave me new tools. I didn't know that I was good at organizing things and being a leader. Like that's a skill set that came out of me in college. So I am very thankful to Humboldt for that experience. That's great. What a great story about your mom. Um, what that, what an extraordinary pivotal moment uh, and that your, 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 your mom uh, created it. And then you obviously met the challenge and, uh, and, uh, sounds like, you know, had a really exceptional and thriving experience in college. Um, were there, obviously you were highly involved and instrumental and, you know, uh, became aware of your leadership potential, which is great. Were there, were there any challenges during that experience that, uh, you had to work through? Absolutely. I So despite it being a, a nourishing environment, it, it could be toxic. I went to an institution where there were 252 Black people and 8,000 white people. And there was a lot of racism on campus and a lot of racism off campus. We actually had some very pivotal experiences with the police department arresting uh, several of my classmates and us having to show up in court to support our friends. And luckily our professors did the same. So we endured some traumatic times that I funneled through my writing because I wrote for the newspaper. So I would then write those stories out. Um, I kept communicating, whether it was poetry, spoken word, whatever it was, I just kept letting it out of my heart so that I could heal too through the process. And that's what got me through the toughest of the times, whether I was dancing it out, writing it out, speaking it out. That's how I got through college. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's, uh, that's extraordinary. And, uh, you know, it sounds like your response to those very difficult, racist and unfair uh, moments were uh, incredibly adaptive. Um, so you graduate from Humboldt. What was your uh, next step from the standpoint of your education? Oh, I was done. Like most people, I didn't want to go back to school again. I was like, I'm, I'm, oh, this is over. No more education for me. You guys have done the most and I am done. Um, and then Hurricane Katrina happened. And while I was not a resident of Louisiana, was not from Louisiana. I was in back home in South LA watching Oprah, watching Hurricane Katrina happen. And what clicked for me was that all the things I had read about in the literature about racism were real. People had signs up begging for help. Please save us. I was like, okay, I have to do more. So after being home for six months, working in and out jobs, uh, I finally said, okay, I'm going back to school. And I went back and got a master's in cultural anthropology so I could really, really learn the history behind how we see ourselves in the present. That eventually took me into public health because you can't know the history and not do anything about it. And that's how we get to the moment that I'm in today because I just have to do something about knowing that history. And after your master's in cultural anthropology, did you go on to a doctorate in public health or what was the next step there? I did not, I worked. Like I am a girl from the, the hood hood. So, you know, all this getting a degree after degree was not in my path. I worked, I worked in community-based organizations. I taught anthropology at the community college for 14 years. Oh, wow. And then I went back when my best friend developed breast cancer. I said, I got to do something about it. 
went back to school, got a second master's in biostatistics and epidemiology. Then I worked again. I started yep. my own company. Uh, I did liaison between scientific and, acad and uh, community organizations. And then after years, I finally went back and got the PhD at Morgan State in psychology. Uh, did you say Morgan State? Yeah, the Morgan oh, State that's great. PCUs. That's great. That's great. So, I mean, look, what's uh, fabulous, many fabulous things about that story is that, you know, with each educational moment and leading to graduation, you know, you went back into the workforce, you know, did things that you were felt passionate about, learned a great deal, but then ultimately went back. And I, I, I think I, I don't want to oversimplify. I'm simply saying that ultimately by advancing in higher education, it seems like, though feel free to correct what I'm about to say, you, it's not, you were doing great work all along, but maybe the width or the bandwidth that you were able to participate in from a professional standpoint and lead got a little bit bigger with each step forward. Uh, and, and now you're at, you know, arguably one of the best schools of public health in the world, uh, you know, doing the work that you want to do. Um, along the way, if, if you were to say to a listener, you know, uh, in the Bronx, uh, who may or may not be thinking about going to college, or a listener in Philadelphia, uh, you know, here near Chestnut Hill College, uh, who may or may not be thinking of going to college, what would you, uh, what would you want to say to them? I would say, think about what college represents for you and not about what other people tell you about it, because it's really about you and your journey. I strongly believe that whatever force you believe in in the world puts things only on your plate for a reason. And so if education is coming up on your plate, that's something only you can do, right? Don't let other people's relationships they've had to some of these systems deter you. Because at the end of the day, it's about your development. It's about the skill set you need to do only that one thing you can do in this world. Don't delay the world because you're oscillating on the decision. Claim it. Do it so that we can get the beauty that is you. That's great and a great message. I want to thank Dr. Atkins Jackson, AJ, for uh, uh, sharing her uh, exceptional journey. I wanna thank our viewers for tuning in. This is Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. We'll see you next time. Until then, take care.